And now for some political analysis. Dan Balls is chief correspondent at The Washington Post. Susan Davis is a congressional correspondent for NPR. And Mark Landlord is a White House correspondent at The New York Times. Dan, uh, we've been talking a lot about the hirings and firings at the White House this week. You saw late Friday Attorney General Jeff Sessions fire the deputy director of the FBI, uh, Andrew McCabe. Some are saying this will win him a few political points. What do you make of this? Well, I think that's probably right. He'll, he'll, he'll gain some points with the person he needs to gain those most with, and that's the President of the United States, who very much wanted to see McCabe go and, and had been, had been tweeting for a long time and making statements that and I think put the Attorney General in a position where he had to act and had to fire him. Um, and we have seen since that firing the President of the United States come back in and ratify that and push harder on that. So I think that what we what we saw was the intimidation coming from the President of the United States. Again, we haven't seen the, the, the report, the IG report that lays out the rationale for the firing and I think everybody is, is right in saying we have to see that before we can draw full conclusions. But there clearly was pressure coming from above on the Attorney General on this. He was not acting simply as an independent agent. And we know that because the President sent a tweet at one point specifically pointing out that McCabe was going to retire for full benefits and this firing came hours before that would have been possible. Right. And, and uh, you know, we've, we've seen a number of people say, regardless of the merits of the case, the notion that this was rushed in a way uh, as to be punitive and mean-spirited is part of the issue that we now, we now have. And following that, John Dowd's statement yesterday that this would be a good time for Mueller to close down the investigation, initially suggesting he was speaking for the president, then walking that back, again raises this question of the pressure that is being put on the Justice Department and on the special counsel. Susan, you're already hearing from Jeff Flake. In the yeah. past, you've heard from Senator Graham say, don't go near Bob Mueller. That's a red line here. Is that for show? I mean, Mark Short from the White House was saying they haven't heard that kind of outcry from congressional Republicans. You know, what we have heard from congressional leaders like the Speaker and the Majority Leader in the Senate is that they have confidence in Mueller's investigation, that they don't support any effort to interfere with the investigation. I do think that the interpretation of the president's reaction to the McCabe firing does seem like there is an acceleration of his frustration towards Mueller. I don't know what happens if the president really does try to close down this investigation or, or go further with firings at the Justice Department. Congress has really been, under Republicans, uh, quiet and largely about how the president has handled this. They have not been very confrontational with him. It has been described as a red line. I do think that's fair. I do think Senator Angus King, who you heard earlier in the program, say something along those lines would, would be like a constitutional crisis. And I think he's, he's accurate in that. I think it's a concern, though, that Republicans at this stage continue to keep private. We did not see much of a reaction coming from Capitol Hill, either about the firing of McCabe or his comments about the Mueller investigation. But the concern is real. Uh, you did have a few comments saying the Judiciary Committee is going yeah. to be looking into exactly what happened. Uh, the question here, too, and as Dan said, it's not, we don't know a lot about the substance, right? We haven't seen the IG report, but I do think there's a lot of members of Congress that look at this and are, do raise questions about the timing. Mm -hmm. And why didn't they make a better case to the public? If, if the substance is there, if Andrew McCabe did deserve to be fired, if the facts are on your side, then let the facts play out and let the public be on your side. And so the way it was handled, I th do think uh, it, it, there is some frustration. Congress has not been very aggressive in its oversight of this administration. This might be something they just simply can't ignore. Mark, the president already had quite a week uh, of news after firing his secretary of state, leading to these reports of chaos, upheaval, more changes to come. Uh, what is happening? <coughs> what, what is motivating this kind of communication from him today? Well, I mean, the president's talked recently about how he's actually getting closer to having the cabinet that he wants in place. And, you know, there's a school of thought that says he that... He picked the first cabinet. He picked the first cabinet, but to be fair, uh, he picked some people he didn't know well, people who were recommended to him by outsiders. Rex Tillerson is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. And now after 14 months, I think he's coming into his own, and I think he's decided he wants to have people around him who agree with him, who see the world the way he does, who don't push back. Uh, one thing about Rex Tillerson is he pushed back on the Iran deal, for example. Mike Pompeo, by all accounts, won't do that. Uh, Tillerson was w very forward-leaning on diplomacy with North Korea at a time when the president wasn't. Uh, Pompeo would be much more inclined to line up with the president. And so I think that we're seeing the president, in some sense, 
uh, coming toward having the type of people around him that he's most comfortable with. And then you also have to say, this is a guy who does operate uh, by having a chaotic environment around him. The type of chaos that many people would find untenable, President Trump is comfortable with. He always has been in his business career, and he is now as president. It was interesting to me to hear Senator Corker in our interview basically say, yeah, the Iran deal most likely is dead in May. Um, as you bring up, Mike Pompeo, the nominee to be Secretary of State, has been a vocal critic of that deal. I mean, what do we extrapolate from some of these changes the president is making to his cabinet? Well, the Iran deal is an interesting uh, test case because you've got several people on the national security team who have argued strenuously that the president not rip it up. H.R. McMaster. H.R. McMaster, Jim Mattis, the defense secretary, and the secretary, the former secretary of state. With Pompeo in place, you'll now have one less voice making that case. And also, to be sure, the president has gotten more and more impatient each time he's had to make this decision. And so I think Senator Corker is reflecting reality, which is we're at the end of the line for this deal. And without Tillerson's voice there to defend it, the likelihood is much higher he goes ahead and rips it up. Dan, uh, you know, also this week you had the president saying that this defeat of Republicans in this Pennsylvania uh, special election wasn't really a defeat. It was in some ways a referendum of Trumpism. <laughs> Is that how you read Connor Lamb's victory? <laughs> Not exactly. Uh, I mean, if you want if you want a good example of uh, a great attempt at spin, that was the argument <laughs> that in one way or another, Connor Lamb became the, the new congressman from that district because he was very Trumpian. No, I think quite the opposite. Um, I think this was, as we have said many times, this was a district that went 20% uh, margin for Donald Trump. But it also went 17 points in favor of Mitt Romney in 2012. This was not just a Trump district. This was a solid Republican district. And the fact that it moved as dramatically as it did is an indication that Republicans have stiff headwinds heading into the midterm election. Uh, yes, Connor Lamb said some things that put him in a little bit better position in that district. He said he wouldn't vote for Nancy Pelosi as, as Democratic leader, for example. Uh, he talked about being in favor of the Second Amendment. Uh, but in many other ways, he ran it on Democratic issues. Um, and the turnout was very, very strong. And so I think we saw two things. One, that there were obviously some people who had voted for Donald Trump in 2016 who ended up voting for Connor Lamb. And the second, which we've seen again and again and again, uh, is that the energy and the enthusiasm and the intensity is greater on the Democratic side at this point than it is on the Republican side. Susan, do the stiff headwinds change the calculus of those in the Republican Party right now in terms of the willingness to challenge the president? It is a very tricky thing for Republicans to do that because the one thing that was true and also in Pennsylvania was true is Republican voters aren't angry at the president. They still like him. The question is, are they gonna show up and vote for people down the ballot? And Democrats faced a similar problem under the Obama era that Democratic voters still liked Barack Obama, but they didn't show up in the midterms to support him. One of the lessons of these midterm elections is that the president can hurt you, but he can't necessarily save you. And that I think Republicans even though there was some very optimistic spin coming mm -hmm. out of this race, are very aware of the fact that the House majority is very much in play and that if they can't figure out a way to run in an environment where the president has an approval rating in the low 40s, that the, a lot of unexpected losses could be coming their way. Susan, Dan, Mark, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you. We'll Thank be you. back in a moment.